Good morning. We're live here from the birdhouse. It is mid-June and today we're going to be talking about attracting butterflies and moths and hummingbirds to the garden because it's about that time of the year. We'll start seeing more and more and more of them as the season goes on. As always, we like to know who is on. You can say hi in the comments or if you have any questions, you can throw those in there too. And we always like to know what kind of things you're seeing. So you can throw those in in the comments as well. Any kind of bird activity you're seeing, butterflies, interesting things in your yard, absolutely throw those in the comments because we love to know what kind of things you're seeing. As far as events go here at the store, at the birdhouse, we do have an event coming up this Saturday. Actually, we've got two events. Uh, we have another plant sale going on on Saturday with Michael Hainan. He has rare and unusual perennials and he also sells a lot of natives. He'll be here on Saturday as well as Dana Ford from Braddock Bay Raptor Research and some of her crew are going to be here with not only live birds of prey, but they're also going to be doing a used book sale and it's a name your price book sale. She's got a whole bunch of books people have donated to her over the years, um, all kinds of different nature subjects and we'll be doing a book sale where you can just pay whatever you think the book deserves and all of those donations will go to uh, Braddock Bay Raptor Research. So that is happening this Saturday so it should be quite a bit of fun. We've got those two different events going on and um, she'll be having some of her live birds of prey here too. She has a great horned owl, she has a red-tailed hawk so should be um, a nice event on Saturday. Lots going on here. But today we're talking about butterflies and in turn moths and hummingbirds and gardening for them and talking about not only the nectar producing plants that they like but what are called their host plants so we will just dive right into it um the first thing that i think is is important to to talk about when you're talking about butterfly gardening especially is the metamorphosis that insects go through, including butterflies, and they undergo what's called a complete metamorphosis. So each step of their life cycle is completely different from the last. So they undergo what's called a complete metamorphosis where they look totally different in each step of their life cycle. So they are insects. They start off as an egg, like they all do. And then out of that egg hatches the larva or the caterpillar and then after spending all of its days eating and chewing and um, getting much, much larger, that larva or caterpillar will pupate. So they form some kind of a pupa, whether it be a chrysalis or a cocoon. And then out of that pupa will hatch the adult. So each life stage will sometimes require different plants. So here in this picture, this example is the monarch butterfly. Um, they're pretty easy because they have one specific host plant that they can live on um, completely. And that's not totally true with all um, butterflies. So the, the monarch is kind of uh, an exception to the rule sometimes with as far as uh, host plants and their nectar plants go. But each species has different has different requirements. So if you're trying to attract monarch butterflies, they require one type of plant group. If you're trying to attract black swallowtails, they require different types of plants. So each species does have different requirements and it is important to plant not only the nectar producing plants for the adults, but then those what are called host plants or the plants that the, <clears throat> the adults will lay their eggs on. And those are the plants that the eggs will hatch and those caterpillars will eat. So as far as butterflies and moths go, their larvae are called caterpillars. And the caterpillars look totally different from the adults, of course. And they have completely different physical structures all the way around, including their mouths. So caterpillars, if you think, it's, it's like that book, The Very Hungry Caterpillar, that's not too far off. The caterpillars really spend their whole day and their whole uh, that whole part of their life cycle just eating and eating and eating and eating so they have mouths that look like they're chewing so they have chewing type of mouth parts that they can bite off pieces of leaves meanwhile the adults the adult butterflies or moths have what's called a proboscis so it's like a straw that will suck nectar out of plants and they are both covered with scales that give them color. They're in an insect order called Lepidoptera, and that stand that um, 
that that means scaled wing. So if you were to, to, to translate that from Latin into English, it means scaled wing. And they are covered in tiny little scales. So this is a close up look at a butterfly wing. And if you look closely, you can see that it is covered with tiny little scales. So if you've ever touched a butterfly or moth wing, you might see that you've got powder on your hands. That's from all these little tiny scales. So that's what gives them their color. And that's why their wings are so delicate when um, when they first come out of their pupa or their cocoon, they are really brightly colored. And then as they go on, they tend to look more weathered. That's as they're losing their scales, they'll start to look a little bit more dull in color. But as far as butterflies and moths go, what's the difference between the two? I like to talk about this too. Um, a lot of people say, well, butterflies are really beautiful. They're big, they're showy, um, and moths are kind of drab and um, they're, they're kind of ugly looking. That's not always the case. So everything on this top row here is actually a butterfly, including this white one here, which is probably the most common that you'll see in your backyard called the cabbage white butterfly. A lot of the times that gets confused for a moth because it is just a white color. And then on the bottom here, these are both moths actually. So moths aren't always um, just really drab in color. They can be very, very showy and very beautiful. So to learn the difference between the two, there are some structural differences and there's things that, that they do differently. Um, as far as butterflies go, their antenna has some kind of projection at the end, some kind of a ball or something that is larger at the end. I'll show you kind of an up close zoomed in picture of that and most butterflies in fact all of the butterflies that we have here are diurnal meaning that they are active during the day and then when they're at rest they hold their wings up over their body i mean sometimes you can see them with their wings spread open um, but for the most part when they are at rest like this picture shows here with the monarch butterfly their wings are uh, holding up above their body when they're at rest and then the Butterflies will form a chrysalis, and that is uh, like we saw in that first picture of the metamorphosis, and I'll show you some more. That's that kind of hardened shell where they will have their metamorphosis inside. And then moths have antenna that are either completely straight with no projection at the end, or they look like feathers. Most moths are nocturnal or active during the night, but we do have some here that are active during the day. And then when it rests, moths like this luna moth here, they have their wings spread out when they're at rest. So um, that's another way you can tell the difference between butterflies and moths. And then moths will form a cocoon. So I'll show you some of these pictures here. In the top left, this is the butterfly antenna. So it's got that projection at the end. It does get larger at the end. And then the next two are moth antennas. So it's really easy to see in this middle picture here, those antennas that look like feathers. And they use these big showy antennas as a way to uh, to find out if there's other mates nearby. They can, uh, they can use those as kind of a chemoreceptor to um, to kind of see what kind of chemicals are out there to, to react to pheromones from other moths. Or they have antenna that are just completely straight like this one here. So those are uh, the differences between antenna, the, the butterfly here on the left, and then the moth are the other two. And then the chrysalis, showing the difference between the chrysalis and the cocoon, here's a swallowtail. And then this is their chrysalis here. So it's that hardened outer shell. And then the cocoon here of a moth is right here. So you can see it's covered by all kinds of fibers. If you were to open up that cocoon, inside there's something that almost looks like this chrysalis here. It would be a hardened shell of a little pupa inside. So those are some of the differences between butterflies and moths, if you were interested. But anyway, getting back um, to attracting butterflies, you do want to make sure to plant plants for all stages of their development, something for the adults to lay eggs on, something for those caterpillars to eat, and then something nectar producing for the adults because the adults might sit by, uh, pass by and sip on the nectar, but really providing something for the egg laying is really, really important. And that will give you more of a diversity and more uh, quantity of butterflies. There's a whole bunch of different types of butterflies we have around here. And here's just some of the different, here's a couple of different groups you might see. 
out there. Um, we'll kind of get specific on some certain species and what attracts them. Uh, but here's just some general, a couple of general groups that we have. The skippers. So when most of the time with butterflies, we see the big showy ones around. Uh, but if you kind of scale back and take a look at things a little bit closer up, you might start to see a bunch of really tiny butterflies. So we do have these butterflies around called skippers. There's a whole bunch of different species. A lot of them are kind of orangish in color like this, not super showy, although there is this really beautiful black and white skipper here that has speckly kind of wings. So there are different types around and they have very triangular shaped wings like this. And when they fly, it almost looks like they're skipping. So their wings kind of kind of flap and it looks like they're kind of skipping through the air. So that's how they get their name. So we've got a bunch of different butterflies around here called skippers, very, very small. And then even smaller, are things like this. These are called the blues, the little blue butterflies. Um, you might be familiar with the Carner blue butterfly. It's an endangered species here in New York. But when their wings are at rest up over their body, they're, they just look like these tiny little white butterflies. But then when they open up their wings inside, they're, they're quite blue. So right now you might see what's called the spring azure or the eastern tailed butterfly. And this eastern tail butterfly, this is the one with the wings at the rest. At, at rest. If you look in uh, the very end of its wing, at the very edge, it's got these tiny, tiny little tails that stick out. So that's how it gets its name, the eastern tailed white. And the spring azure, there's a summer azure, but um, these are just a couple other little teeny tiny butterflies you might see around as you, as you go looking for some. Um, as far as certain butterflies and how you can attract them to your yard, we'll go through uh, quite a few different species here and just to show you what their host, uh, the host plants are. So where they will lay their eggs and what those caterpillars are going to eat. And then at the end, we'll talk about the different nectar producing plants that not only butterflies like, but hummingbirds too. They kind of get grouped together. So the cabbage white is probably the most common butterfly that you will find in your yard because it can feed on a whole bunch of different types of plants. It is an introduced species. It's really common in backyards and gardens. Not only can the, the caterpillars feed on different grasses, they can also feed on a lot of different plants that people plant in their yards for vegetables uh, like cabbage, kale, bok choy, Brussels sprouts, broccoli, mustard plants. So um, if you've got some vegetable plants in your backyard and you're seeing some bites out of them, could be from the cabbage white butterfly. And this is what their caterpillar looks like. And they blend in super, super well with the, with the leaves of the plants usually. So they usually tend to be almost the same exact green as the plant, which is pretty, uh, pretty interesting. And when they're at rest, they usually, I found they kind of like tuck up against the veins of the plants. So they can be really hard to see. They camouflage super well and they almost look like the vein of a plant. But this is what the cabbage white uh, caterpillar looks like. So keep an eye out for them in the garden because they are very, very common. Uh, they can be considered pests depending on uh, <laughs> depending on if you're gardening for vegetables or gardening for butterflies. So uh, keep an eye out for them. And then there's the eastern tiger swallowtail, another common species that we have around here. And a lot of the times they'll come not only to your nectar producing plants, but you might see them flying high up in the treetops in the canopy of deciduous trees. And the reason for that is because they do lay their eggs on a lot of those as their host plants. So not only are host plants small uh, little flowering type of plants or vegetable plants, a lot of trees are host plants for these butterflies. So the eastern tiger swallowtail for some examples of plants that the caterpillars will feed on our hornbeam trees, ash, if they're still around, if you can find any around, um, tulip trees, wild cherry, willow trees, basswood trees, birch trees. So those are all host plants for the Eastern tiger swallowtail. So trees are just as important as the smaller plants when you're talking about butterfly gardening. And um, they, the caterpillars feed high up in the trees. So your odds of seeing one Probably not that good. I have yet to see a tiger swallowtail caterpillar, not to say that they're not 
around a lot. They are definitely around because there's a lot of the adults flying around. Um, the females are dimorphic, meaning sometimes they look yellow like this, sometimes they look black. So if you see a black swallowtail type of butterfly in your garden, take a close look at it because sometimes you can see there's little stripes on it. Um, so they do have what's called a dark morph. So the females can be either yellow or black and they're they will go in all kinds of different habitats. They like deciduous trees, they like river valleys, um, edges. So, you know, edges between um, woods and open fields are perfect for the Eastern Tiger Swallowtail. We have other types of swallowtails around here too, like this spice bush swallowtail. And this is what the caterpillar looks like here. And it has these giant uh, what are called eye spots. Those are not actually the eyes of the caterpillar. In fact, the head is kind of down here. If you can see my mouse wiggling down here, this down here is the actual head of the caterpillar. So its eyes are down there somewhere, uh, but these are eye spots to scare away predators. And the spice bush swallowtail will feed on, like its name suggests, spice bush and also sassafras trees. And it likes woods, so you'll find spice bush in wooded areas. Um, sassafras trees you can find in different woodlands and, and edges of forest. So this is another species we have around here. So it's a black colored swallowtail. It looks a lot like the black swallowtail. There's one way to tell the difference between the spice bush swallowtail and the black swallowtail, which is this one. And that is just this black swallowtail will have this tiny little black dot here on its wing. So I think it'd be really hard to tell the difference between the two. But the one you're more likely to see anyway is this black swallowtail as far as your backyard goes. Unless you're close to a woodland or in a woodland, then it could be a spice bush swallowtail. Um, but this is the black swallowtail and this is one you might see in your garden because the caterpillar will feed on some different herbs that are commonly planted in yards like um, dill, fennel, and parsley. So when you're planting your butterfly plants, um, it couldn't hurt to put in some dill or some fennel, some parsley to mix those in with your flowering plants. That's what I started to do to try to hopefully attract the black swallowtail. And as far as the dill and the fennel goes, they, they kind of look neat with the other plants. It gives a different kind of texture because they have very feathery type of leaves. Uh, but this is what the caterpillar looks like. And the swallowtail caterpillars, and you can see it very well, in this black swallowtail, they have something called an osmeterium, and that's this crazy thing that's sticking out of the caterpillar's head here in this picture. And what it is, is when they're disturbed, they tend to kind of rear up on their, their back legs, and they stick this, this thing just comes out of their head called an osmeterium, and it emits a foul-smelling odor, and that's a way to try to get predators to leave them alone. So um, pretty neat what they can do. And they are another fairly common butterfly that we do have here in the area. So this is what their caterpillar looks like when it's when it's full grown, but has, when they're smaller, they are darker in color. So they might not look like this um, right away. It might take a little bit until they get nice and big like this. So black swallowtail, another common a fairly common butterfly we have around here. They also feed on Queen Anne's lace, which is a common, you know, roadside wildflower. It could be considered a weed. So if you have that growing wild in your backyard, you might want to consider keeping some of it because it is a host plant for the black swallowtail. And then here's the adult again. The adults can look kind of different from one another. Sometimes they have a lot of yellow. Sometimes they hardly have any yellow on them and they're more blue. So the way you can identify them is with that tiny, tiny little dot there that's on the red part of their wing. So that's the black swallowtail. And then there's also a giant swallowtail that we have. This is the largest swallowtail species. Uh, they're pretty rare, but you do see them around here and there. They like rocky and sandy kind of soil. You can find them near streams a lot of the time. And they like citrus plants. So if you happen to have like a lime tree or a lemon tree that you put outside for the summer, keep an eye out for their caterpillars starting to show up on your citrus plants. They like prickly ash. They'll also feed on hops. And this is what their caterpillar looks like. And their caterpillar will mimic bird droppings. So that's another way that they try to keep predators away. They also have this 
osmeterium that will stick out of their head if they're disturbed. So um, that is the giant swallowtail caterpillar. Uh, some other different types of butterflies we have around here. This is one of my favorites. It's so, so pretty. This is called the Baltimore checker spot. And these are about the same size as that cabbage white butterfly. So if you're familiar with the cabbage white butterflies and their size, the Baltimore checker spot is about that size, maybe a little smaller, just to give you kind of a size reference. And they'll feed on plantain, which is a common plant to have growing in your backyard uh, mixed in with your uh, grass. It's a common weed, if you will. They'll also feed on white turtle head. So you can usually find pink turtle head pretty well in garden centers. White turtle head is a little bit harder to find, um, but you can um, that you can find it if you look hard enough. And this is that that's one of their host plants as well as foxglove, false foxglove, um, beard tongue, they like marshes, bogs, fields, and the caterpillars, which are also bright orange and black and really, really beautiful, they will group up all together. So usually you just see one caterpillar on one plant. That's not the case with the Baltimore checker spot. They will all go on one plant all at once. So you'll have a whole bunch of them all congregated on one plant together. So this is the Baltimore checker spot. Really, really gorgeous butterfly that we have around here in upstate New York area. There's also these guys called the question mark and the comma, and they're in a group of butterflies called the angled wing butterflies. And if you look at either of the pictures really, but especially on the bottom, you can see why they're called angled wing butterflies or wings are just kind of all these funky angles there. Um, they're not smooth edges. And these are two different species here, the question mark and the comma. And the difference between the two is very hard to decipher. When their wings are spread open, they both look like this picture at the top. But when their wings are folded over their body at rest, that's when you can tell the difference between the two. So the question mark is here on the bottom. And if you look really closely at the wing, you can see there's a little a sign that almost looks like a question mark. So there's almost what looks like a little apostrophe and then a dot right below it. If it doesn't have that dot and it's just the little um, crescent, then it's a comma. But this picture here is of a question mark because it looks um, kind of like a question mark there on its wing. So that's how you can tell the difference between the two. And they feed on basswood trees. They'll also feed on nettle species. So keeping some nettle around, as long as it's not something that's going to, uh, you know, sting you in the garden or anything like that, that can be really helpful for these guys because it is a, um, it is a, a, a plant that the caterpillars will feed on. It's one of their host plants. They'll also feed on elm trees, on hops. Um, so uh, they, this is another one of those butterflies that if you put out a butterfly feeder, um, those butterfly feeders, I'll show them later on in the presentation, but they feed nectar, but a lot of the times they will also have a place for rotting fruit. They're well known to feed on rotting fruit and also sap on trees. So this is one of those butterflies you might be able to attract with something like a butterfly feeder. The morning cloak is one that you can find early on in the season. These butterflies will, a lot of them will spend the winter inside a chrysalis. Uh, but the morning cloak is different. The morning cloak will hibernate or uh, overwinter, if you will, as an adult. So that adult butterfly will wedge into tree crevices or hollow trees. Um, if you've got a butterfly house, that's what they're really used for is a space for the butterflies to spend the winter. Morning cloak are one that might use those. So the morning cloak will spend all winter as an adult. So then early on in the spring, this is one of the first butterflies you'll see. As soon as it starts getting warm enough, those morning cloak will be out and about. You can even see them on warm winter days. So if we've got one of those random, sometimes not so random, warm winter days in January or February, you might see, even if there's snow on the ground, a morning cloak flitting around um, because the sun is shining and it's warm enough for their wings um, to kind of pump and to fly. So pretty cool as far as morning cloak goes. Their caterpillars will feed on willow, elm, cottonwood trees, aspen, poplar trees. So this is another butterfly 
who will use a lot of trees as their host plants. You can find them a lot of the times in forests, not so much in meadows, but um, I usually see them when I do see them. I see them a lot of the times in forests, in the um, understory of forests. So um, this is what their caterpillar looks like here. Looks kind of scary with those spikes, um, but it is not poisonous or anything like that. And if you were to touch it, those, those spikes, um, they don't hurt. They're just pretty soft. The red admiral is another butterfly you might see in your garden. And these have really erratic flights. So if you see a kind of a, a butterfly that looks pretty manic almost in its flight pattern, it's probably a red admiral. They move really, really fast. They actually are a migratory butterfly. And we do have some years of booms of their population, maybe like 15 years ago or so, there was a huge influx of red admiral butterflies. They were everywhere. Um, so that was pretty neat. Their, their caterpillars also will feed on nettle species. And you can find them just about anywhere near streams, marshes, fields. They have a wide, wide habitat. So keep an eye out for that red admiral with those bright red stripes on the wings. There is the Viceroy, which is a mimic of the monarch butterfly. It looks a lot like the monarch butterfly. Their caterpillars will feed on poplar, willow, and fruit trees. And they like, uh, you know, some of the same habitat as some of these other butterflies, swampy areas, lake edges. And they, uh, with their, them being a mimic of the monarch, uh, they tend not to get eaten so much by predators, but the one, there's actually two ways you can really tell the difference between a viceroy and a monarch butterfly. The first being viceroys are smaller, so they're not going to be as large as that big showy monarch butterfly. And then they have a stripe that goes through their hind wing here. So that stripe, which is both visible when it, their wings are at rest over their body and when it's their wings are spread out, you can see that stripe in its hind wing. Monarch butterflies do not have that. So that's how you can tell you've got yourself a viceroy. Oops. So this is the monarch butterfly. You can see there's no stripe that goes through its hind wing, and it's going to be larger than that viceroy butterfly is. Monarch butterflies are one that a lot of people are familiar with. They will feed on milkweeds. They will feed on common milkweed, swamp milkweed, butterfly weed. So any kind of milkweed species is great for the monarch butterfly. They seem to really prefer the common milkweed. Those leaves on, on that plant are so, so big. It gives the caterpillars a lot to eat, um, but people can be indifferent to growing common milkweed in their yards because um, it can kind of grow pretty wild and be hard to control if it's really established. So you want to consider that. You might want to do swamp milkweed or butterfly weed instead of the common, and I'll show you what they all look like as we go on here. Um, you can find them in any kind of open area, um, even roadsides where milkweed is growing, uh, open fields. You can find them by pastures, marshes. They do have a migration where they will migrate down to Mexico in the fall, which is pretty amazing. Right now they're on their way back up to the Rochester area. We should start seeing them pretty, pretty soon. Any day now we'll start to see those monarch butterflies coming back into town and we'll do a whole class on monarch butterflies as we get on into the summer because they are just so interesting. They've got a really interesting lifestyle. Now there's also different moths you might get in your garden or in your yard or you might see them when you're out hiking and they're not all necessarily um, ones you want to come in contact depending on your situation. Um, the tent caterpillar is one um, that people are kind of indifferent to because they can totally defoliate different trees. And um, this is a picture here of what they're, of, of what they do. They'll form these big web-like tents in trees and you'll have a whole bunch of tent caterpillars inside of there and they will just defoliate a full branch and sometimes a nice, nice section there of a tree. So they can be um, kind of a pest to some people. That being said, they are a really good food source to different birds, um, including birds like cuckoos really love these big cat, uh, these tent caterpillars. Um, so they are a good food source to birds, but you know, they can also kind of wreak some havoc on your trees. So they can be uh, not necessarily a caterpillar you want to have around, but I thought I'd show you what they look like. This is the caterpillar here. 
And then this is what the, the moth looks like. So we see the caterpillars a lot, but not so much the moths. So I thought I'd show that one. There's also the gypsy moth, which looks very similar to the tent caterpillar. Um, but you can see the tent caterpillar has really a uniform color and that stripe that goes down its back. The gypsy moth does not, and their coloration is kind of bluish by its head, and then it turns into red spots as it goes down its body. Um, the gypsy moth is now also known as the spongy moth. Um, it's been kind of renamed, but most people know it as the gypsy moth, and it is uh, not native to the U.S. It is an introduced species. They're well known to defoliate trees. The Finger Lakes area has been having some pretty major issues with gypsy moths. They go through these big cycles of booms and busts. I believe they're, I want to say they're about seven year cycles, I think is, is what they are. So they can be a threat to trees and shrubs. They tend to prefer deciduous trees, but once they run out of deciduous trees, they'll also even feed on pine trees. So they'll eat just about anything. So that is why they can be such uh, an issue and uh, to have around. But this is what the caterpillars look like, which is what you tend to see um, more so than the or than the, the moths during the day. So I thought I'd show you what the moth looks like there. So that is the gypsy moth or the spongy moth. Um, some other moth species and caterpillars you might be familiar with. This is the woolly bear caterpillar who has its own name. It's so well known. And this is that fuzzy little caterpillar that you'll see in the fall. And they're pretty common because they feed on things like dandelion, plantain. So they'll feed on, on grasses that you might already just have growing in your lawn. There is a myth that the longer the middle brown band on the caterpillar, the milder and shorter the coming winter will be. But then the shorter the brown band, the longer and more severe the winter will be. It is a myth, but it's uh, something that people sometimes go, go, uh, go by. But this is what the woolly bear looks like. And then as a moth, it's actually quite beautiful as well. It's called the Isabella tiger moth. And that's this bright yellow moth here. So that's one that you'll see out in the fall. You'll see those little woolly bear caterpillars. Now we also have what are called, we have several species of what are called giant silk moths, which are really beautiful. And this is another type of insect you probably won't see the caterpillar because they do feed high up in trees. This is what the this is a cecropia moth and this is what its caterpillar looks like. It looks pretty pretty wild, pretty crazy there. They'll feed on maple trees, cherry trees, apple trees, oaks, poplars, sassafras. So they feed on a lot of large trees as far as our caterpillars go. This is the largest moth in North America as well. And these giant silk moths as in their butterfly form don't live very long. They only live for about a week. Um, basically they all come out at once, they mate and then they die. So it's not a very long life that they have. So you tend to see them in July is really when you start to see some of these adult giant silk moths. And this is one of them, the Cecropia moth, largest moth in North America. Here's another one called the Royal Walnut Moth or the Regal Moth, and its caterpillar is called the Hickory Horn Devil. And if you look at it, um, it looks pretty scary there and you can see why it has that name. And like its name suggests, they do feed on hickory trees. They also will feed on walnut trees, pecan trees, sweet gum if you're further down south, um, and sumac trees. So another really cool looking giant silk moth that we have in the area. And then there's the Luna moth, which a lot of people are familiar with. It's a bright green moth um, here, really large green moth. And this is what its caterpillar looks like. And they also feed on hickory, willow, maple, um, so a whole bunch of, you know, oaks and beech trees and cherry trees. So again, another another host plant, uh, another uh, caterpillar whose host plants are a lot of these large trees. So it's not just all small plants. It is, uh, it's a lot of the trees as well are really important for these butterflies and moths. Now here's another one that you might get in your backyard because um, this is a caterpillar that feeds on maple trees, including silver maple, which are really, really common. But this is the rosy maple moth. And as an adult, 
they're bright yellow and pink. So they're, this is the smallest of the giant silk moths. They're, they're quite small. They're about an, about an inch long, I want to say. And um, really, really beautiful coloration though. This is what the caterpillar looks like. And so this is one you might find in your backyard more so than some of those other giant silk moths, but really, really pretty little moth there. And then there are day flying moths like this hummingbird clear wing moth. So a lot of moths will come out during the night, but that's not true all the time. This is a day flying moth and it does mimic a hummingbird. Um, usually it'll make you do a double take if you see it in your garden because it does hover like a hummingbird does, likes the same kind of plants a hummingbird does. And um, you can just see the way, it, um, the way its body is kind of upright like that while um, feeding. It's just like a hummingbird. So we do have those around here as far as a host plant for them. And this is the caterpillar down here. They like viburnum trees, hawthorn trees. They like honeysuckle and also fruit trees are places that you can find these caterpillars. So they are often mistaken for hummingbirds and even bumblebees too, because they are quite large and um, they have they like the same kind of plants. So keep an eye out for that in your garden. I always see them at my bee bomb. They seem to really love bee bomb. As far as ways to attract butterflies to your backyard, it's not just all about plants all the time. Butterflies will do something called puddling. And um, this is a picture here of them doing it. So if you ever are out hiking or if you if you happen to have some kind of a, a natural water feature in your yard, you might see this at the side of a pond or the side of a stream where there are pockets of water and a lot of mud. Butterflies will do this where they perch at the edge of the water and they'll land in the mud and they'll siphon out the water from these muddy areas. And what they're doing is they're, they're siphoning off the nutrients, the salts and things like that from the soil. And it's an, a thing called puddling and the male butterflies apparently tend to do it more so than the female butterflies. Uh, but this is another thing that you can try to mimic in your yard to attract butterflies by doing what's called a butterfly puddler. And I would suggest a butterfly puddler even more so than say a hummingbird feeder. Um, first of all, it's, it's lower maintenance and um, we've heard that you, people have been having better luck with attracting butterflies to the puddlers than the feeders. But you can make a puddler just about out of anything, an old bird bath, if you've got, you know, a plant saucer, anything like that can be turned into a butterfly puddler. A dish doesn't have to be fancy at all. And this is an example of one here. You can see that there's some large rocks in the center, and that's good um, as far as places for the butterflies to land. And then there's some different rocks. There's what looks like some sand in there. So you can just throw some, some rocks, some sand, some dirt into a, a dish of some kind, fill it with water so it's wet, but not so the water is full like a bird bath because the butterflies do need to be able to land somewhere on there. And the butterflies will land inside and siphon off some of the water and nutrients from the puddler. So something kind of different and another way you can attract butterflies to your yard. So now there are feeders as well. And the butterfly feeders are very similar to hummingbird feeders. They hold nectar. So the bottom of this feeder holds nectar. The main difference with butterfly feeders is that the butterflies can't reach inside the, the port, the feeding port, like a hummingbird can or an oriole even, if you've got an oriole nectar feeder. So what they do is butterfly feeders have this wick that is inside and that wick will pull the nectar up from the inside of the feeder and bring it up here for the butterflies to land on and they'll just dab it with their proboscis. So that's the main difference between a butterfly feeder and your hummingbird or oriole nectar feeders. You can use the same nectar. Um, we do have some butterfly nectar that you can try if you are trying to attract them specifically. So that is your butterfly feeder. And they do have spots for fruit a lot of the times too. So you can put bananas, you can put melon on there. And uh, butterflies like those angle wing butterflies, the question mark and the comma seem to really like the, the rotting fruit. There's butterfly houses and butterfly houses are very different than say bird houses. It's not a place that the butterflies will lay their eggs or um, you know, the caterpillars will be, it's nothing like that, but this is a place for hibernation. 
for them. So if you have a butterfly house, the, uh, the best thing you can do is fill it with sticks and tall grasses. And the idea is the adult butterflies, if you've got some like the morning cloak that will overwinter as an adult, um, you can stuff it full of sticks and hopefully that butterfly will wedge in there and spend the winter as an adult. As far as um, these three things go, the puddler, the feeder, and the house, I would do the, the puddler first, then the feeder, then the house, as far as the order of, of how you, you, of what you'd most likely attract butterflies with. There's also bee houses. So if you're trying to attract pollinators in general, these mason bee houses are great. We talk about them all the time. Um, these are a place where the the bees will actually lay their eggs. So it's different than the butterfly house where the bees will actually go inside there and lay their eggs. So the butterfly houses and bee houses are actually quite different. Um, gardening for butterflies and hummingbirds can be a lot of fun. Um, so here's a picture, a couple of pictures showing kind of um, what a butterfly garden or hummingbird garden <clears throat> might look like very colorful um, the different colors do bring them in i would recommend also sprinkling in here with your blooming plants other things like the fennel and the dill and the parsley uh, some of those host plants that the butterflies like um, but as far as the the gardening goes for these plants that the butterflies and the hummingbirds like the nectar producing plants. You wanna make sure that they are brightly colored. Hummingbirds really like the tubular plants, like here's a hummingbird here on some native columbine. As far as hummingbirds go, the color red does draw them in. And for butterflies, purples and yellows draw them in quite a bit. You want to make sure to avoid pesticides uh, because pesticides will kill the insects you don't want, but they'll also kill the insects you do want. So um, they don't discriminate. So you definitely want to avoid any kind of spraying uh, to it when you're trying to attract butterflies and hummingbirds. It's just not good for them. It will kill them off. Um, so these are some of the different nectar producing plants that um, that work well for attracting butterflies and hummingbirds. If you've got some plants that work well for you, absolutely throw those in the comments. I'd love to know what kind of things you're having success with um, because everybody has different things that work well for them. So love to know what kind of things work well for you. You can throw those in the comments if there are certain plants you've had good luck with. Um, bee balm. So bee balm is a good one. You can get it in different colors. It is native. Um, the native varieties of it are bright red like this picture here or purple and uh, you can find it at just about any kind of garden center. Hummingbirds love it and hummingbird clearwing moth I constantly see it on bee balm and also butterflies will feed on it as well butterflies and bees. Um, there's columbine this is an early spring bloom mine in the yard is still in bloom but it's uh, kind of fizzling a little bit. Um, so this is one of the first plants that'll bloom in the spring. And that's really important too for not only hummingbirds, but for butterflies is to have things in your garden that are blooming spring, summer, and fall. So having a variety of different plants, something that's always in bloom in your yard. There are native and non-native species of columbine. The native version, which is this one right here, it has kind of spikier blooms and some of the stuff you tend to see in garden centers. Um, but this is what the one I would recommend just because it's native and the natives really will, will give you more of um, the native species. So this is the native columbine that you can find at some different garden centers. Um, lupines are another good one for the hummingbirds and the butterflies. They produce a lot of nectar. Black-eyed Susans. Black-eyed Susans are great for butterflies. They bloom a long time. They're super easy to grow. Um, they spread quite a bit. So you want to maybe keep an eye on that if you've got them in your yard. Um, but what's nice about Black Eyed Susans is that if you leave those blooms up and if you don't trim them down in the fall, you'll also get uh, goldfinches feeding from it in the fall. They'll feed from the little seeds. Cardinal flower is the seems to be the favorite of hummingbirds in my backyard. It has long spikes of bright red flowers. Hummingbirds absolutely love this. I tend not to see a lot of butterflies on it, but the hummingbirds love it. They are 
constantly going to it. Um, coneflowers are another one, super easy to grow. You can find them everywhere. And not only do butterflies like them, but this is another one, just like the black-eyed Susan. If you keep those uh, flower heads up in the fall, goldfinches will, will eat from the little seeds um, from the seed heads. There are trumpet vines and trumpet honeysuckle. So these are two different types of vines that will attract hummingbirds specifically. The trumpet vine is on the left here and it has these really huge bright orange flowers. You can see the hummingbirds just shoving his head right in there. Um, the thing with the trumpet vine though, it can be really hard to control. Once it's established, it really spreads. So you, unless you have a really large area you want to cover or, you know, maybe a side of a shed that would look really nice covered in trumpet vine, you might want to hold off on the trumpet vine. But the trumpet honeysuckle is much, much easier to control. And that is here on the right. It has kind of thinner blooms that are more of a pinkish color and the hummingbirds absolutely love this. I've got one in my backyard and um, there's constantly hummingbirds coming to it um, once they once they find it. So I would recommend that one more so than the trumpet vine. There's Joe Pie Weed. This is one of my favorites to grow. It's super easy to grow. It grows just about anywhere and it gets quite tall and it has these really fine purple flowers that'll bloom throughout the summer. So Joe Pie Weed, super easy to grow. You can find it at a lot of garden centers now too in their native plant section. Uh, New York Ironweed reminds me of Joe Pie Weed, except it gets even taller. And the blooms are a little different. They're kind of rounder, a bright purple, and this will bloom late in the summer into the fall. And yeah, this gets very, very tall. I've got one that's maybe just a few years old in my backyard, and it's probably last year like seven, eight feet tall. So it gets really, really big. So it's really, really cool to see. Asters are great in the fall. Uh, I've got some that just kind of pop up in the yard. So they really spread um, if I don't control them, but I like to keep a few just because I know they're a great fall bloom for the, the, the monarchs, especially as they're migrating down south. They do need those nectar sources. So I do keep asters as well as some goldenrod, even though the goldenrods have um, really spread in my backyard. So I have to kind of control them a bit because they take over everything. Uh, but it is a really important nectar producing plant for especially again, monarch butterflies as they're going down south in the fall. And this is another butterfly here on the right that we didn't talk about specifically, uh, but it's another species we have around here called the common buckeye that you might see. Sedum is another good one, especially again in the fall. It's one of those fall blooming plants. And then fuchsia is a good one. It's not a native, but um, it is common in garden centers as an annual. Um, you can find it in hanging baskets a lot. Now there's upright versions that you can plant in your garden or in planter boxes. And this is really popular with hummingbirds also. Then there's lantana. This is another annual, at least here in New York. If you're further south, like in Florida, it is not. It's around uh, year round. It's sometimes considered invasive depending on where you are, but here it's too cold to last more than a season. So this produces a lot of nectar and it's great for the butterflies and it's a really good filler plant to fill in if you've got some spaces in your garden that are empty. I always fill them with lantana. This is one you can find with um, hanging baskets. I've seen a lot of lantana hanging baskets too. Uh, gladiolus, another, another type of flower that hummingbirds will go to. And then there is butterfly bush and like its name suggests, the butterflies absolutely love it. Hummingbirds absolutely love it. Now the downside to butterfly bush is that it's not native. So there is that. So it can spread, especially if you're down south, not so badly up here in, in upstate New York at least, um, but it can spread. I meant to add, there is a native that kind of takes the place of butterfly bush called button bush. And it has these white blooms that are round and um, kind of spiky. And that is what people are suggesting now that you plant instead of butterfly bush, it's called button bush. And actually I, I just planted one last year in my yard. It turns, it's a shrub, kind of like the, the butterfly bush ends up being. And um, I saw down, down south in Virginia a few years ago, came across a button bush 
and it was covered in butterflies. I've never seen anything like it. So that's what inspired me to put one in my yard um, because it is a native and the butterflies were just going crazy for it. So um, I'm excited to see that eventually bloom. It's kind of small still, but um, button bush is one I'll have to add to this presentation, but that's something you can plant instead of the butterfly bush. And we'd love to know what kind of things work in your yard. So you can put those in the comments. Uh, if you've got any plants that have worked well for you, absolutely throw those in there. That's everything I've got here for this presentation, but it looks like some of you guys are on with some comments and things. Um, Vicki is on. She says, good morning, birding community. This year is the second time bluebirds are nesting. Last year, they were victims to a predator. There are five eggs now, and I put the tunnel protector on. Parents were confused and went away. Day three, I took off the tunnel. Not sure if I should put it back on. It's a new bluebird-specific nest purchased at the birdhouse. Your staff suggested putting the tunnel on at night and taking it off during the day. Any other suggestions to protect the eggs and hatchlings? Um, so depending on where you have it, if it's on a pole, you can put a baffle on the pole. That would keep predators from being able to climb up that pole and reach in to, um, to grab the eggs or the nestlings. If that's what you had the protector on for, that's, um, that's what I would suggest. Uh, and it sounds like if they're, if the parents are kind of confused and not coming to it when the protector's on there, that's something then that you could do is if you've got the time to remove it and put it back on. Um, but if you are concerned about predators, like mammal predators, like squirrels and raccoons and opossum and things, raiding that box, um, I would put a baffle on the pole. That would be less uh, work for you too. Um, let's see, Ed is on. He says, we're seeing some disturbing activity at our Mason Bee house. Uh-oh. Um, something is pulling a few of the tubes partially out and chewing on them. Any ideas who that might be? I thought it may be field mice, but then it occurred to me because of the whole like appearance of the tube, it may be the smaller woodpeckers like the downy or the hairy. It could be, yeah. Woodpeckers are known predators of mason bee houses. They'll absolutely peck at the little mud, uh, the coverings of mud to grab those pupa out of the mason bee houses. So it could be that if it's chew holes though, yeah, maybe it is mice. Um, I had a, a weird experience with my Mason Bee house a few years ago where there were wasps getting into it too, where uh, I don't know what kind of wasps they were, but there were these giant wasps. It was later on in the season though, it was in the summer, in the late summer, and they were going into the Mason Bee house and you could almost hear the sounds of something inside almost like squeaking, um, which I assume must have been the, the, the mason bee pupas or something. It was a crazy sound. Um, so it could be probably not an insect if it's chew holes, but that my best guess would be it is some kind of a woodpecker. So you can put screen up if the mason bees are done, if you don't see them hovering around the house anymore, which they're probably not. Um, it's getting to be about that time. They're around for about two months or so. So if you're not seeing any more activity with the bees themselves coming and going, you can cover it with a, uh, a screen, just any kind of screen you would find at Lowe's or Home Depot or anything like that. And as long as you take it out, take it off in April, that's fine. And that'll protect it from predators. Another thing you can do if you've got a garage, you can put your bee house in the garage. Um, just don't bring it inside because the mason bees will hatch out too early and then they will be in your house. Um, but you can keep it in the garage as well. And that's what some people do to kind of keep it away from predators. So I'm curious if you find out what it is, absolutely let us know. Um, Bob is on and says Orioles are feeding hatchlings. All right. So uh, Bob has confirmed that the Orioles eggs, some of them have hatched. And so now is absolutely mealworm time, time to feed, feed those Orioles mealworms so they can feed their nestlings. Um, he says female bluebirds still incubating second brood of four eggs should hatch after the 19th. Cedar Waxwings building a nest in neighbor's maple tree, gathering materials from my yard. So Bob's got a whole bunch of fun bird activity there, including Orioles feeding their hatchlings and bluebirds on their second brood of eggs. Very exciting. Um, let's see. Vicki says, how many days in total for bluebird eggs to hatch? It's about two weeks. I believe it's anywhere between 10 and 14 days, something like that. So it's about two weeks that the parents will incubate those eggs. 
Um, Lynn says, are they taking mealworms? I've been watching, but haven't seen mine take any yet. Um, as far as uh, different birds taking mealworms, it uh, yes, they definitely are. Um, whether you're looking for something specific to grab them, that's that's another thing. With um, Bob's comment on Orioles feeding their nestlings, I would guess what over the next few days, you'll start to see more Oriole activity at your mealworm feeders. If you've got bluebirds, they've been eating the mealworms all year round, or you know, all, all season long. And now that their eggs are hatching and their young are around, they're feeding them more. Even birds like chickadees will come to those mealworms. So you should start seeing more activity as more and more of these baby birds are out there and they're hungry. And there's definitely a lot of them out there. Um, Lynn says, my bee bomb hasn't bloomed yet. Is this normal? Absolutely. Yeah, mine is still growing in the backyard. The only ones I've seen in bloom are the ones that you buy like right now from garden centers where they've kind of forced the blooms early. So yeah, it's it's still too early for the, the bee bomb to be in bloom, at least in my yard. It's still growing. Um, the plant itself is still growing and I haven't seen any buds on it yet. So it's still early for the bee bomb. Um, Diane says, thanks. Absolutely. Thank you, Diane, for watching. Um, Ed says, great show again. Thank you, Ed. So much good information. You guys got it. So um, that is everything we've got for you guys today. We'll be back on Saturday with another broadcast. We've got a lot of stuff going on here at the store on Saturday. As I mentioned earlier, we've got a plant sale with Michael Hainan that's going on starting at 10 o'clock and that'll go usually till three or four. Um, he's here and then we have Birds of Prey from Braddock Bay Raptor Research that will be here from 10 till one. And not only will we have the birds, but they will be having a used book sale and you can just name your own price on those books. So bring some cash give Braddock Bay Raptor Research a donation. All that money goes right towards the care of those birds that can't be released into the wild. And 100% um, of that donation goes right to them. So uh, we will be back on Saturday with another broadcast. Until then, have a great week and we'll talk to you soon. Bye-bye.